Thursday, January 5th, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight we talk about TV from our childhood. Let's do this! Alright, so um, my company owns this other office. Well, they own a lot of offices all over the country. But they own this one office that's like on the border of Connecticut and New York in a weird place. And they've been trying to make me go there, or like asking me to go there recently. And the other day, I accidentally slept too much, and my alarm didn't go off, or I fucked up, or who knows. And they you know, sent me an email after I told them I wasn't going to show up, because it's not worth it to go with the train and such, to the city, at such a late hour. And they're like, why don't you go to Vista? And I'm like, uh, because I have a crap car, and I'm not going to drive like an hour in a crap car. You know, it's not worth it. So today, the boss's boss calls me to his office, and I'm like, ooh, maybe I'll get fired because uh, my job is pretty boring <laughs> right, n- right now because I don't have a project to do, and I haven't been doing much there. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of ambivalent to whether I keep the job or not. <laughs> so they, uh, he tells me, to my surprise, they want me to work in the Vista office because they need someone there. There's no one there. So why do they need someone there? I don't know. They don't. I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go in and be all in next time. Cause that's kind of weird. I but mean, you can want, just work. But to to get me to work there, they're just gonna give me a car. Oh really? He was like, "Yeah, we'll just lease you a car or give you a raise so you can buy one." That's not a bad deal. Then maybe you have to see how far a drive this actually is. Yeah, I'm gonna go there tomorrow, and then on Monday I'm gonna sort it all out at work after thinking about it over the weekend. Uh huh. But if it really is like an hour drive, it might just be too painful. It's not worth it. Yeah, because I had a 45 minute drive down the mountain when I used to live up there to work, and it really wasn't that bad. But I don't know if that extra 15 minutes each way would have added up. Yeah, I don't know. Plus, I had a nice happy drive through the mountains. You're gonna have a crappy drive through non throughway parts of New York State. Hmm. The real question is whether maybe if I get like an iPod in car type of thing, I could be maybe okay. You know, did you have an iTrip that you lost? Yeah, that was only an iTrip Mini now, so that I got a Nano, it doesn't even matter if I lost it. Nah. I'm waiting for my iTrip Nano that I pre-ordered to show up. Is it even shipping yet? Nope, I pre-ordered it, and I'm still waiting. And they said December. Guess what? It's January. Well, raise a stink. Uh, I might raise a stink, or I might just say fuck it and get one of those like car integration kits. Yeah, they're not that expensive, and they're actually a lot better than the iTrip. Yep. Because the iTrip see, uh, is great and all, but it uses the FM uh, mini broadcast type thing, and that's real antenna, weather, moon phases, sunspot dependent in terms mm-hmm. of quality. Well, if I accept this offer and get the car, they'll probably look into the integration kit, and not if not, I'll probably just wait for the trip to show up. Yep. All right. Yep, but in real news... Remember that horrible, horrible Windows exploit we've been talking about, the WMF thing? Do we have to talk about it again? Well, Windows uh, released an emergency patch today, and I just want to kind of warn all of you out there who might not keep abreast of this to go download it immediately. Yeah, it's probably not going to be a Windows update. It's probably going to be a hotfix that you can get, you know, so the hotfix is the quickest, safest way. Yeah, just there's a link on Slashdot. I can't follow it because I run Firefox and Linux, and it, it notices that and doesn't let me see. But you need this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked it up, and I'm not going to talk about it more, other than that this is a terrible problem that will screw you if you don't get it fixed. Mm -hmm. Well, um, when did we first notice this problem? Uh, About a week ago, if that. So they fixed it in a week. Yeah, they fixed it much later than that other guy who just put out a patch that fixed it did. How fast does it usually take, like, uh, I don't know... Uh, Gen 2 Linux to fix a problem? Nah, about a day at most. Fair. How about uh, Firefox? When does, how long does it take Firefox to fix problems? Uh, the only problem I was actually aware of, but I mean, most problems I became aware of them after they were already patched. I remember one, and it came out, and I was like, crap, now the internet's dangerous. And then a patch came out like two days later. Hmm. Uh, Microsoft is the lose. Uh, yeah. Though I did find out one interesting thing about this exploit, and this is the last thing I really have to say about it. Do you realize that it's not a bug? Well, it's not a bug. It's a it's a flaw. Or no, it wasn't really even a flaw. It it's not. It wasn't like a buffer overflow or anything you'd expect. It was a feature that was built into the WMF parsing stuff a long, 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 long time ago, and just no one remembered it was there. So what? 
what what was someone supposed to use this for? This feature? Uh, as best I can tell, I just kind of cursorily glanced over it. It was a function you could call within WMF to escape and then run a process. So it's an image file format. But well, it's a meta file. I mean, it, I, I, I think that it looks like you can store other data in it. Uh, so it's, it seems to be a very broad file format. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never actually seen anyone use them heavily, so... No, the only, I mean, I saw... Oh, you I know used them, a lot. them heavily? Visual Basic uses them Yeah, I was about to say, when I used to write Visual Basic crap back at RIT, I used a lot of WMF files. Hmm. And a lot of really poorly written applications that I get from third-party developers at work have WMF files, like, embedded in them. Yeah. But other than that, they're, they're only in the wild if someone's trying to get you with this exploit, basically. Yeah, if you make your website with WMF files... You've got issues. Yeah, use use pings. Pings and JPEGs and GIFs. Yeah, we won't say GIF even though it's technically correct. Technically correct, which there was a guide about uh, that got popular recently about the pronunciation. Anyway, so the Consumer Electronics Show is currently happening in Las Vegas, Ah. which means lots and lots of electronic goodies for us to look at. Anything interesting? Well, you know what? Most of it was just new cell phone, new camcorder, new cell phone. Yeah, 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 whatever. Great. You know, that kind of stuff. But there were two things that caught my eye because they were new and interesting. The first one was this Philips uh, LCD screen. It's flat, of course. It's an LCD screen. And it goes on a table and faces up. Isn't it also touchable? It's a touch screen also, and it can also detect other things, uh, like little cubes that rest on it and their positions. Now, I assume that Philips has some stupid ideas about what they like to use it for, but I have three words. Dungeons and Dragons. That's a good one. I have one more word. Battletech. So that's another one. Actually, the demonstration that I see here, it looks like a normal, uh, you know, roll the dice, move around the board kind of game, but um, it has a theme of, like, taxi cabs driving around a city, and they have these nice translucent cubes moving around that you can move around the board. You can touch the board to like select where you want to go or what you want to do, and that's pretty cool. I mean, you wouldn't have to bother like publishing and buying forty dollar board games anymore. We could just buy one of these things, you know, when it becomes cheap enough, because it's sure not cheap enough right now. Nope, it's going to be thousands of dollars right now. But in the future, you know, these things will probably be pretty cheap, and then we'll be able to just download and program board games for it, whether they want us to or not. And yeah, because we'll be pretty much one of the main things that slows down our board gaming. Cleaning it up, resetting it. Yep, or even getting it out. Because Puerto Rico, we used to play that like years ago and, and over the summers we had nothing to do, 10, 20 times a day. Mm-hmm. And pretty much we spent about as much time resetting and cleaning up the game as we did playing. Not only that, but think about this, rules enforcement. You won't mess up rules because the game will know. Yeah, no matter how tired you get, you can't accidentally buy, like, seven heroes at the end of San Juan. Yep, and you won't be any question of, like, people looking at other people's stuff or anything kind of... It'll be perfect. Absolutely solve every board game problem that ever existed. Like the occasional game of Tigers and Euphrates we'd have where, like, three quarters of the way through the game, someone looks and there's, like, a red tile on a river. And we're like, who the hell put that there? Yeah, that won't happen. So... I'm looking forward to this maybe a few years down the road. Possibly. It'd Definitely have to be real a, big, though. Living room installment, for sure. Like, I'd like a coffee table-sized one. Yeah, this one looks pretty big. You could probably play, um, like, Monopoly on it. And if you can play Monopoly on it, you can play most German games on it. Yep. I don't know about Battletech unless you have some sort of zooming in and zooming out. But they could make it bigger. I mean, LCDs are getting bigger every day. The other thing is something that at first I glossed over... But uh, then came back to and realized why this is the big news of the day. Uh Uh-huh. Sony come out with this uh, e-reader device. All right. I'll say right now that I have pretty much zero interest in e-readers. I also had zero interest in e-readers and e-books because I said, what the hell? I like reading a regular book better. I mean, I had a nice PDA a while ago till I sat on it. Mm -hmm. And I used to use it, like, back at RIT, I'd put textbooks on it that I didn't want to pay for that I found online. And then I'd just kind of read them. Mm-hmm. And it really just hurt my eyes and was a pain in the ass and sucked. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I agree with all those things. However, this e-reader uh, is amazing. And let me explain why. Is it magic nano paper where it feels like a real book and I can just flip the pages forever? No, in fact, that's its one flaw is that it's actually still like an electronic device with buttons and everything. But it's not too thick. It, it's actually a good thickness. 
you know, thinner than most laptops. And it's about the right size you would want, where the screen is about the size of a manga. And the device itself is only a slightly wider than that, maybe like a half inch on either side and like an inch and a half on the bottom where the buttons are. The awesomeness of it is that it's still black and white, which is kind of eh, but for reading books, who cares? Is that everyone who's seen it and every picture I see of it, the completely normal black and white screen is as paper. No eye hurting, no no LCD, no CRT, no nothing. It's it's this amazing new screen technology, and it looks like paper, and it hurt, doesn't hurt your eyes. It, it's like as you're reading paper. Is it luminescent at all? The problem with it is that there's no backlight, so you can't read in the dark without a light. Uh huh. But other than that, it it, it, it for as, in terms of your eyes and the pain, it's as paper. Now, that alone is not enough to make it amazing. The amazing part is that even though it's an evil Sony device, it's going to be wide freaking open. You're not going to be able to only read special DRM ebooks on here. You're going to be able to load PDFs on here. If you try to load a document file on there, it'll convert it to a PDF. The software will support, like, if you put an RSS uh, feed, it'll automatically download, like, the articles from the RSS feed and turn them into PDFs and put them on here. So you could just plug it in, wake up in the morning, take it, get on the train and go, and the newspaper will be on there. Well, your you know, your constructed internet newspaper will be on there. Just huh. to read as if it was paper. In black and white, of course, but whatever. Now, you ready for the, the killer? Is the killer. Uh, they were demonstrating something to read on here. And you know what the demo uh, image was? Uh, Call of Cthulhu. No. The Trigon manga. Really? Uh, Tokyo Pop. Uh, uh, Tokyo uh, Pop wait, doesn't. Uh, uh, all right. I see now the potential, and the potential is cancellations. That's a good potential. But Tokyo Pop, I don't know. The, the, I know the Trigon manga is from Dark Horse, but Tokyo Pop has already publicly announced they have fully signed on to this device. You will be able to soon get digital Tokyo Pop manga and read them on this thing. And I think that's awesome because the number one problem I have with manga is storing it all. And if I can store it on a hard drive and read it on one handy dandy device, that's worth at least a hundred bucks. Well, I guess it just comes down to how much it costs then. Right now, the guesstimates are between three and four hundred, but I say I'll wait for the second generation of the device and it'll be probably be one two hundred. Yeah, I'd pay about a hundred and fifty for that now that I think about it. And I think that's what it's gonna be when the second generation of the device comes out. All right. So, uh, Evil Sony, uh, here's one good thing they've got going, uh, some potential. I can't believe that's Sony. Yeah, I can't believe it It must be it like either. one of the few tiny non-evil branches of Sony that What's the problem with such a big corporation is that, you know, different parts of it are good and different parts are bad. Yep. Yeah, but uh, if you don't believe me, just look at some of the pictures of this thing. You can tell from the photographs that the screen is, like, awesome like paper. It's great. And the controls look like you can actually, you know... Go forward and backward through the book sensibly, which is important. So as all of you know, I read Fark. And a little while ago, since it was the new year, they had a contest for the best Photoshop of 2005. And I got to say, many of them are very hilarious. And I have linked to the collection of the winners. It's a good thing this is a collection because... uh, Usually, when you look at the FARC photoshops, they don't, they're not filtered very well, and it's like 90% crap, and there's very few good ones. So when, it's a good thing that they did this, because now you can see all the good ones in one place. Yep, it's not like something awful where they have like the perfect moderation. Yeah, and only the really good ones get shown, except for the ones that are in the Hall of Shame, which uh, get shown. Are usually also hilarious for other reasons. Because they're in the Hall of Shame. Yep. It's uh, also worth 1000 I think, has a big list of theirs usually they go for the uh skill in photoshopping and not so much the funniness yeah but they also have the funniness but i found it funny that the number one like by a significant margin was one making fun of the intelligent design people great and a flying spaghetti monster was there I and a whole bunch making fun of good old george w mm, uh, it's oh. just so easy to to make those jokes yeah all right so uh, we all like uh, art exhibits, 
in art museums and things, right? Yes, no, maybe. Anyway, uh, this one I'm sure everyone will like because it consists of art based on old school video gaming. The name of it is called I Am 8-Bit, and it's going to be on display, I think, in San Francisco or something. I don't know. But uh, if you go to their website, there's a cool gallery showing some of the arts that will be at the show, and some of them are quite awesome. My favorite is this one where Dig Dug is like standing there inflating the giant lizard with a little pump. I got to say, I wasn't too impressed with the uh, promo art for this, because I saw it, but it looks like it might be cool. Yeah, if the show was nearby, I would totally go, like, in a second. Though there was that one time when I went to a gallery with uh, Emily in New York City, just a random gallery, and we're looking at art, and in the bottom left corner of one of them was, and this is kind of random, because it's not what I expected to see at all, the mascot to my, the anime club I ran at RIT was Mezinger Z. Mm -hmm. and in the bottom right-hand corner of this random piece of art was a very obvious picture of Mezinger Z, and it was raping some other robot from behind. Well, that's what Mezinger Z does, you see. Uh Uh-huh. So I've never actually seen Mezinger Z. Ah, I haven't seen much Mezinger Z. It's not something you really want to watch all of. Yeah, it's one of those shows. It's a very old-school robot show, and... Really, there are very few old school robot shows that you should watch all of. And you could watch a few Messenger Z episodes just to be all cool and old school, but I totally don't recommend watching the whole thing. Though, speaking of old school, we decided, since we had nothing better to talk about today, we were going to reminisce about uh, all those old TV shows we used to watch when we were little. Because we don't watch TV anymore. Yeah, and we realized there's a lot of these shows, so we pretty much just picked the ones that are all from a common-ish era. Mm, and we picked the ones from our early childhood. We left the uh, middle school and late elementary. Like, the late elementary school was the cutoff, pretty much. So we're not talking about Ren and Stimpy or Simpsons or anything just yet. Yeah. Maybe we'll talk about those some other day. In oh, fact, definitely. since those are more recent and we have more memory of them, they could probably take up whole shows on their own. Though, we're, we figured we'd start. We just kind of picked an order here. Good old Sesame Street. Ah, Sesame Street taught me everything yep, until I, I got to nursery school. I learned how to count to ten in Spanish and French. Mm, me too. I also learned how to eat cookies. <laughs> I gotta say, there need to be more shows like that. I mean, I guess I was lucky that my parents were smart, and they made me watch Sesame Street. And I guess I was lucky that I was smart enough to enjoy it thoroughly. I agree with both those things. It's also kind of funny how even today, like... Some of the things from Sesame Street, if I see them now, it's not like, it doesn't feel like a dumb, like I see dumb kid shows on TV, or if I watch Sesame Street today, or it all started like when that Barney came out, right? Then kid shows started getting dumb and painful to watch. Teletubbies. Yeah, stuff like that. But I can still watch the Sesame Street that I watched when I was a kid. If I watch it now, it's not painful, and in fact, it's awesome. Yep, 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 yep. I don't know if that's because of nostalgia. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. It could be because of nostalgia for it and, you know, like memories that it invokes. But I'm pretty sure it isn't because I'm nostalgic for some other uh, TV shows from my childhood and watching them now is just painful. So the fact that Sesame Street isn't painful really says something. I just really wish it was more popular. Yeah, it used to be huge popular. Like it was the only show for little kids. Now there's just so much competition that... You know, the people who uh, do the heavy marketing instead of the nonprofit people trying to be intelligent, you know. Get Plus, ahead. I noticed that, I mean, the two other shows that were educational that we watched when we were kids Square One and 321 Contact. Yeah, Square One. I don't think either one's still around. Square One didn't last very long at all, but it was, it was so amazing. I can't believe, you know. In fact, I remember when I was a little kid, I'd get into arguments with my friends at school because none of them had heard of or watched Square One, and they all watched 321 Contact. Uh, see, I didn't watch 321 Contact that much. I, like, I remember it coming on, and I remember about it, but I never don't really remember anything from it. Square One, I remember vividly certain parts. Yep. Especially that episode where they talked about negative numbers, because I didn't know anything about negative numbers. Less than zero. Less He's our hero. Zero. Yeah, that one. I remember yep, the yep. song and everything. Because I remember he goes to throw the uh, javelin, and it goes backwards. And yep. they're like, oh. The thing was that I knew about, I knew that there was a such thing as negative numbers, but I didn't quite get it until I watched that episode. And I was just like, enlightenment. I remember in particular the one about fractions, where the guy had a key ring with eight keys, and he used two of them. And then he had... 
of uh, six out of eight keys left. And I was like, oh, that's what fractions are. The one about percentages where they go into like the store and he's like, yeah, you take off some number percent. Get it? Oh. oh, I know what the percent sign means now. I mean, that show really didn't pander to kids at all. It was just like, all right, here, here's here's learning. Here's, here's knowledge. Lear- here, we're going to teach you all the math that you will learn throughout elementary school in one TV show. I mean, I and remember it- watching, watch his name, running away from the uh, tornado guy. Oh, my God. That was the absolute best part of the show, and it was also the absolute worst part of the show. Because he'd be go- he's like, he's going strong, he's going strong, and then he'd be like, no, don't eat the three. It was so great because you love video games and you love Pac-Man, so watching that was the same kind of feeling you get now when you see cool internet videos and things. And it was just my most, I waited it, I waited for that part of the show more than any other part. But the guy was so dumb and he always got eaten by the tornado and I was always pissed off. I'm pretty sure there were a couple times where he got away. Uh, You know what? I don't remember it that well, but if anyone can get videos of maybe him succeeding at the puzzle or the tornado getting screwed, but actually I thought the tornado was cute. Yeah, my other favorite part was actually the uh, the math squad at the end. Well, it was, uh, what was it called? Uh, MathNet. MathNet. Because I remember, you guys realized that there was a movie to that. Was there really? Yeah. We I'm have like, to get I, it. We I have had to it get on it. tape. We so have when to get I fly it. out to Arizona to see my mom, I'll see if she still has it. We have to get that. Is it on Netflix? I don't think so. I'll look. I'm going to check eBay as soon as we're done here. Because that movie was actually kind of cool because I remember watching it and it was about a lottery scam. And mm. all I remember thinking when I was a kid was, wow, I should pull that scam because there's no one that smart in the real world to stop me. Yep. The thing about MathNet was like at first when I would watch Square One, MathNet would come on. At the, it would always be the last thing in the show, and it would be like five minutes long. And it would start, and I remember the opener seemed real boring. So like at first, I just didn't watch it. I would just turn off the show right there because I only wanted to see the funny cartoon bits and you know the math Pac-Man guy. But then I finally watched it one day, and I was like, Oh, yeah. this is the good part. The thing is, as a little kid, I took it at face value. Like, I didn't realize it was supposed to be a joke. Uh, I just took it like, wow, they're awesome mathematicians and they solve crimes. See, the way I took it was that the first part of the show was to teach you new maths that you didn't already know. And that the math net was the part where they showed you how the math was actually useful in the real world somehow. Uh, yeah. And that's that's what it was about. So, though the Richard One Contact had a similar thing, they had the Bloodhound Gang that always came on, like right at the end or right after. Oh yeah, yeah, which I watched half the time. I didn't like it that much, mostly because I thought the kids were dumb and they could have gotten out of the situations in easier ways. Yeah, I always hated things like that. Where, where, whenever you, we, the problem with educational shows is that if you've already learned the education, but you want to be educated instead of just you know nostalgic or something, that. If they're doing something that, you know, is dumb or they're not figuring it out as fast as you did, it's just painful to watch. Yeah, like they'd be going, I mean, it was kind of a gritty show for little kids learning about things. Because they'd go after like drug dealers, kidnappers, they'd get kidnapped, they get beat up. Yep. And I just remember, I'd always think, why don't they just call the cops? They know where the drug dealers are. They're still there and they have drugs. That's well, weren't they the cops? They were real detectives, right? They were just math detectives. What? No, no, no. In, in uh, Oh, the Bloodhound, Bloodhound Gang. Gang they oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They should yeah, have called like, them. They were like little punk inner city kids. Yeah, they should have called the cops. With like sticks for weapons, if that. Yeah, that was whatever. Not much you can do about that. Yeah, it was still a good show. Mm. Well, I think that's it for the educational. Oh, well, we'll talk about Mr. Rogers a little bit, actually. Oh, yeah, Mr. Rogers. I never really liked it that much, but I used to watch it mostly because my little brother wanted to watch it. See, uh, parts of Mr. Rogers were kind of painful, and parts of it were kind of great. Like... When he was just hanging out in his living room, it was usually kind of boring because he was just talking about something dumb. But, like, whenever he went into the backyard where the sandbox was, that meant he was going to do something kind of like a science experiment. And that was always cool. Yep, because I always loved science shows like Mr. Wizard. And- oh, Mr. Wizard. Yeah. But uh, the part where he set the little trolley into the land of make-believe, like, half the time it was cool and half the time it sucked because depending on what puppets he pulled out. Like, I remember there was, like, an owl puppet that was way cool. And, like, the king was way cool. But, like, there was, like, a bird or some kind of animals, and they weren't cool. They were just stupid. So, like, depending on what the story was, it depend on how much I enjoyed that part of the show. I remember I was fascinated with the fact that he had a traffic light, and I wanted a traffic light. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's my main memory of that show is wanting that traffic light. All right. Yeah. 
I remember my parents eventually got me a toy traffic light, and it was freaking awesome. Dude, I had a toy Fisher Price Main Street. That was the best freaking toy. Let me tell ah. you. You could drive little mailman around town and put the mail in the mail slots. Oh, I, dude, I didn't have that, but my cousins did. I could put the mail in the mail slots all day long. The firemen got a lot of mail because they had the easiest mail slot. <laughs> Let me tell you, that was a good toy. All right, now so now we'll dra- do the non-educational shows. The Drek. It's not real. Some of it's Drek. Yeah, some of it's Drek. Transformers was only kind of Drek. The thing about Transformers is that it has a lot of plot holes. It has a lot of animation glitches, a lot of corniness, but it's t- and it was made only to sell toys and not to be a good show. Yes, and like for all of you who don't know, specifically, it was designed to sell toys yeah, from the start. It wasn't even a joke, but you know what? I can still watch it this day and still get enjoyment out of it. I can a little. I mean, I remember always rooting for Starscream. Yes, yeah, Starscream. He was so awesome, but he always made a dumb mistake that pissed you off. Yep. Rodimus Prime never liked him so much. Nope. Bumblebee can go to hell. See, yeah, Bumblebee can go to hell. I like Everyone likes Optimus Prime. Yeah, yeah. Megatron, and- like, he was cool, but he was just too stupid evil. Like, he wasn't stupid, but his evil was stupid. Like, he was just blatantly so evil that he would mess up. Yep. But he was also so powerful that he never lost, really. Though I actually didn't watch so much uh, Transformers. I didn't back watch in the day. so much of it, only I think because of the time slot and the channel it was on. But I knew I always liked it and I always wanted to watch more. Well, plus, I had an, a different, similar show that was my favorite that we'll get into it in a second. Yeah. But yeah, Transformers is still good. The toys were actually better than the show, I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the toys are actually still kind of fun today. If you get some of them, you know, you transform them and they shoot and whatever. The one show that we all remembered as being awesome, and we watched it again, He-Man is probably the worst thing ever created by humankind. Watching He-Man is like stabbing yourself in the eye, especially when you say to yourself, I used to watch that and love it. Not only watch it and love it, but wanted to see the live-action movie. There's a live-action movie? Yes, there is He-Man the movie. He-Man and Man-at-Arms and What's-Her-Name come to Earth. And in the end, the end. All I remember is that the final guy, like that they're fighting, is Skeletor. Beaten. Nah, it wasn't. It was kind of. It's complicated. I have very little recollection of this movie. Mm-hmm. All I remember is that he was defeated with a Casio keyboard. Oh my god! I'm not kidding. Right. So, um, I had more He-Man action figures than any other type of action figure, but I don't actually remember so much of like watching He-Man. I just remember like the Castle Grayskull and fighting Skeletor. And I remember Modulock. Modulock was perhaps one of the best toys I ever had. You, ever, you know Modulock? Which one's that? Uh, he was in like a couple episodes as like this character they created just to sell a toy. And it was like this two-headed red guy. And the toy came with like two different torsos, two heads, four arms, and like eight legs. Uh... And some abdomen pieces and some tail pieces. And you could create like either one giant Modulock creature... Or you could create like two separate modula creatures and you could arrange them in all sorts of different ways to make different things for He-Man to fight. And it was really cool because in the show they did the same thing. Huh. Yeah, but the show, if you watch it now, it's just painful. And you know what? For anyone out there, She-Ra wasn't any better. Uh, yeah. It was pretty much the same crap. Yep, only with a girl. I mean, God, we're not kidding. Don't ever watch He-Man again. That way you can at least maintain those memories and not think that you were just a complete dumb shit when you were a kid. I mean, like, the cat, man. Oh, God, the cat. He's more annoying than C-3PO, but he never gets his comeuppance. Yeah, what's the other guy? Uh, Orca? Orca! Yeah, it, it, yeah, okay. Whoever was riding He-Man, don't let me meet you in a back alley for, you know, take putting stupidity into my brain when I could have been watching something better. So there's one show that I watched religiously, and a lot of my friends, a lot of people didn't watch it. It was kind of an obscure show, though it had, in my opinion, the best toys of this era associated with it. Mm. Mask. M-A-S-K. Mm. I watched that show every freaking day. I have every single toy in duplicate, half of them in mint condition. Wow. Yeah. The show, upon watching it again, was not as stupid as He-Man, but was definitely not quite what I remembered. Yeah, that happens. I mean... There were a lot of shows that uh, also were equally obscure that I watched here and there, like, I don't know, Bionic 6, 
Or that one where there was like a Rock Lords. I have a Rock yeah. Lord actually. The Rock uh, Lords. The Rock Lord toys were kind of cool, but the show, no, not at all. Centurions. Centurions also. I was a Centurion for Halloween once. So was I. I had the blue guy's costume. I had the yellow guy. Ah, because it came with this red rocket that didn't fire. I'd, it was on the gun, and to fire it, you took it off and threw it. No, mine didn't come with anything. I was lame. <laughs> and it came with like a rocket thing. And I must have had armor. the cheaper costume. Mine was just like a vinyl suit and a plastic mask. Oh, God. Mine came with a helmet, like a big plastic one. Oh, you got it. You had the more expensive costume. Yeah, it was awesome. I played with it until it broke. Yeah. But Mask, for any of you out here who watched it, and if any of you out there watched it, let me know, because I really want to find other people who love the show. Mm. It was really cool. Imagine Transformers, only better animated, slightly, with a better plot, at least for the first half of the show, and cool, cool, cool transforming things that fight with each other. Mm-hmm. Do you remember a show where there would be like ropes in a canyon and vehicles would slide back and forth along the ropes? I remember seeing commercials for the toys and then not thinking, not knowing there was a show associated. I with think it. I watched the show like on Saturday morning twice, and I had one of the toys and it broke. I had a friend who had all the toys. Yeah, I, I had a friend who had a dumb. whole bunch of them like all around his ceiling, and he'd slide them back and forth and they'd shoot missiles. See, I think I had the best setup because I had all the Ninja Turtles toys, but the Ninja Turtles themselves sucked. But the the places they had, like the Technodrome, were awesome. Mm-hmm. So I used my mask guys who fit in those play sets a lot better, and I had like the ultimate setup. Yeah, I was always upset that I got I got plenty of action figures, but I never got like you would always want like twenty of the normal henchmen or foot soldiers, and you yep. never got that. And I only ever got one place other than you know Fisher Price Main Street to play with my action figures in, and I think I still have it at my house. Maybe I should go get it, but I never got like. I'll tell you what the place is when we talk about the show, by the way. Uh, Because I had Boulder Mountain from Mask. I had the the Ninja Turtles Underground Sewer and the Technodrome. Nope, didn't have any of those. My brother had the Ninja Turtles van, actually, eventually. Uh, Which folded out into a nice play set. Micro Machines. I had, like, every friggin' Micro Machine. Oh, we had a shit ton of Micro Machines. The problem is when they switched the standard for Micro Machine play sets. You know those squares? And they would fold in half? Yep, yep. And they would attach to each other to make cities? But then they got rid of that, and there was, like, uh, this big van that folded out to make a giant city. Oh, yeah, I remember when the van came out, I got it, and I was like, what the hell? And I stopped buying Micro Machines. Yeah, we had the van, and, and, oh, maybe my brother had the Micro Machines van and not the Ninja Turtles van. I think that was it. Yeah. And it folded out into this great city, and then I had my little squares that locked together down low. Of course, Micro Machines were far inferior to the older Hot Wheels. I had plenty of Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars. I had all four sets, like the big, like with the ramp, even though they're all kind of identical. Oh, I only ever had just one loop-de-loop, and I got rid of it pretty quickly. But I had lots of fun just playing with the cars on their own and on the floor. Yep, yep. I don't know if I was a fan of the Hot Wheels or Matchbox. I guess I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah, I really had no idea. I had cars that were all kind of that size. Yep. And, of course, I had big Tonka trucks. Oh, yeah. But enough about toys. Yeah, we'll do a show on toys. One of the shows that I watched when I was a kid that I can still watch today and still enjoy greatly is Voltron. See, I didn't like it so much, but it's definitely not that bad. Voltron is great. It's 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 a you know it's a standard Sentai show. You know, a bunch of guys group up to form Voltron. Or we're talking about Lion Voltron, by the way. If you like Car Voltron, you can shove it where the sun don't shine. <laughs> you know, and it had all this this great space epic plot that never got, you know, like developed enough. You know, like, they could really go somewhere with it, and in fact, there's a semi-recent comic book that does go somewhere with it. But, um, it was just way cool. There was, like, a castle, and they had to defend the villagers, and the one thing that made it really adult was there was a guy, Sven, and he started out on the team. He was Sven, the guy who talked like he was, you know, named as Sven, but then, like, after a few episodes through the show, like either he was a traitor or he died or something like that. And it was really sort of the intelligent kind of plot thing that the other shows didn't have. Ah. And that's how the princess took his seat in Voltron. That explains that. Yeah. Because I always remember looking around and always Spoiler, seeing. Spoiler! A Voltron! I always remember seeing oh, no. one more guy in a suit than there were places to sit in a suit. I was wondering what was up with that. Yeah, the best thing about Voltron was when they got in Voltron, they would go down these tubes and they would go... It was way cool. And the music was cool, too. And, of course, the last show, which we 
upon watching it again with adult eyes, realized was much more sexually charged than we had thought. It's not sexually charged. It's just well, a it's, story about adolescence and puberty, which I guess makes it indirectly sexually yeah. charged. Well, just, just freaking the sword growing. Yep. Ho! Yeah, thought If you don't know what show we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Already. Well, I remember because I'd never actually seen the first episode of Thundercats until recently. Ah. I'd seen like all the rest of it, and I knew what was going on. But watching the first one, all I remember thinking was, wow, Chitara's naked. Pretty much, yeah. I, I love the Thundercats probably more, th- and I remember it more than any other show, and that's the place that I had. I had the giant Thunder Mountain with the big blue head on it that had lights in it and everything. Oh, wow, I didn't have that. It, it's, I got it in my attic. I should go get it. I don't know where I'm going to ha- put it in this house, but it's a fun toy for sure. And I used to put the Thundercats all in it in different places. And I mean, the show was kind of episodic and nonsensical, but it wasn't really... See, the thing is, it wasn't 100% episodic. It was like this half-episodic, half-serial type of show. Like, there would be... Like, the first few episodes were all serial, where it was like, oh, this is how the Thundercats got to, thun- to the new Thundera. This is how they set up their castle. These, This is them discovering the different people on the planet. You know, like the Burbles, which sucked. The mutants, which were bad guys. Mumra, the big bad guy, you know. But then it just got into a bunch of episodes like, Mumra does evil, we beat him. Mumra does evil, we beat him. The mutants do evil, we beat them. The mutants do evil, we beat, you know, so on and so forth. And then eventually they started, like, the, the plot would change. Like, lion would do, like, a quest thing to, you know, uh, become the real Lord of the Thundercats. And then people from space would come. And then... They started a plot where they went to the, you know, back into space and then they came back and then there were new characters and new Thundercats and then it became more serial again. But I didn't watch those episodes so much. That was nah. after uh, my time. No, I put in our Netflix queue all of Thundercats that's out on DVD. Awesome. So we might actually start doing some uh, reviews of Thundercats specifically. That'd be so great. In months because there are many shows before Thundercats. Unlike He Man, it won't be so painful. Yeah, let's get all of He-Man and watch it again. No, how about we just get like one episode of He-Man and that'll be enough. We'll review that at the same time we review that Mahjong show. Great. I can't wait to watch that. (laughs) (laughs) And that was Geek Nights with Rem and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Thanks for listening. Please remember to point your favorite podcatcher at feeds.feedburner.com slash geeknights to get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Also, please visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com for the latest updates and forum discussion. And whether you love or hate our podcast, we won't know unless you send your feedback to us at geeknights at gmail.com.